All right, so today we're going to be covering chapter 10, section 1, which is the kinetic molecular theory of matter. And first off, if you'll recall, there are three main states of matter. There are gases, uh, liquids, and solids. Now, chemicals in all of these states obey the kinetic molecular theory of matter. In this video, though, we'll only be covering uh, the behavior of gases. Now, you may be wondering, what is the kinetic molecular theory of matter? Now, let's break it down a bit. The word kinetic comes from the Greek for movement or motion. And obviously, molecular is referring to things on a molecular or atomic scale. So, it's a theory, and it's based on the idea that uh, all molecules in all three of these states over here are in constant motion and it successfully describes or at least adequately describes the forces between the molecules as well as their behavior collectively. So the kinetic molecular theory as it applies to gases models what is known as an ideal gas. And ideal gases uh, are not found in nature. However, they are uh, a hypothetical gas that fits perfectly all the assumptions of the kinetic molecular theory of gases and can accurately describe to some degree the behavior of real world gases. So the theory is based on a few assumptions about the behavior of ideal gases. First of all, gases are made up of large numbers of small particles spaced uh, very far apart. So most of a gas is in fact this empty space in here between the molecules, which means that you can push molecules uh, together without much effect on you know, them actually uh, changing the state of the matter. That is, you're mostly just compressing empty space together. In contrast, liquids and solids tend to have molecules you know, touching, but still vibrating, because you'll remember all matter, uh, solid, liquid, and gas, is still in motion. However, Gases are much more spread out than this. They have their molecules about one in every thousand times greater than the volume of uh, the liquid or solid. We also assume that these gases undergo what are known as elastic collisions. Now, elastic collisions means that there is no loss of uh, kinetic energy when two particles collide. For example, if you have two atoms or molecules headed at each other with some velocity v1 and v2 if they hit straight on and then bounce directly backwards they will leave with their same velocities v1 and v2 there's no loss of motion when these particles collide thirdly we assume that these gases are in constant random motion so any given atom could be moving any given way at any given time. And all these vectors average out so that the gas is, as a whole, not moving. And this kinetic energy of each individual atom or molecule is so great that any attractive forces uh, between atoms are essentially negated. So the actual energy of motion represented here by the green cancels out this red attractive force between molecules. So we assume in a gas that there are no attractive forces uh, between various molecules. And you can think about this as they're sort of like billiard balls like we drew over here where instead of colliding and sticking together or you know wanting to be together they simply collide and bounce back with the same energy they had before. And the way we measure the velocities of these gases is through temperature and the temperature is equivalent to their kinetic energy which I'll represent as EK and the formula for kinetic energy is mass times the square of the velocity over 2 so as you can see if you have two uh, molecules at the same temperature like say hydrogen or oxygen oxygen is much more massive uh, than hydrogen so it's moving slower at the same temperature because its mass is higher. However, the kinetic energy is still the same at the same temperature for these two gases. So now we're going to be covering the nature of gases in the real world. And though most, there are no uh, ideal gases 
in nature. Most will uh, behave as ideal gases if you have you know normal temperatures and so the first characteristic we're going to be talking about is gases ability to expand. So gases will fill any container uh, that they're put in. Let's say you have a one liter container with a bunch of gas in it represented by these dots showing individual molecules and then you have a you know a two liter container let's say the same number of molecules will be able to fit into this container it won't just take up you know a one liter space in the middle it will expand out to fill the entire container because if you'll remember gases move or gas molecules move in straight lines until they collide you know with one another or with the walls of their container and then bounce back so eventually enough gas molecules will have uh, their velocities pointing outwards to fill up the entirety of the container it's just the density of the gas will drop because you have the same amount of gas in a larger space gases also have a characteristic called uh, fluidity and this is the ability of a substance to flow easily so because gas molecules are so far apart they can easily glide past one another if there's some sort of force acting on them much like when you run your hand through water the water will just gradually flow over your hand and this is why both liquids and gases uh, are called fluids that is they are a material with the ability to flow e easily so they also have a uh, characteristic of low density and this is because if you will remember as I mentioned earlier gases are about one one thousandth as dense as their liquid and solid counterparts and this is because again the molecules are very spread out in a gaseous system whereas the same uh, system if you were to lower the temperature or increase the pressure the molecules would be packed very close together like this and they'd be vibrating on top of one another if they were liquid they could still you know flow past one another because liquids are still fluids or if they were solids they'd be locked in place but gases because they are mostly this empty space in between they are far less dense than solids or liquids because of this low density gases are uh, compressible that is you can take a high volume of gas let's say you have this gas all spread out in a one liter beaker you can then take you know a beaker that is a quarter of a liter and you can still have all the gas molecules within it it's just labeled quarter li liter but you've just pushed the molecules closer together. You've decreased the amount of empty space between the molecules while keeping the same number of molecules. And this again is because most of the volume of the gases is this empty space over here. The actual molecules take up very little of what is felt to be the gas. Finally, gases exert properties known as uh, diffusion and uh, effusion. Now diffusion is the ability of gases to spread through a room. For example, if you have a flask full of, let's say, ammonia or something with a bunch of ammonia molecules in it, if you take the cork off, the motion of the ammonia molecules, though it's random, you know, some are going to the right, some are going down, some are going up, uh, eventually, after bouncing off the walls enough times, many of them will find a way up out of the container and spread throughout the room which of course has oxygen and nitrogen uh, in the air and because uh, air and gases in general are so low density these ammonia molecules can just you know pass right through and spread throughout the room and the more time you give it the more these gases will naturally mix and of course some air molecules will find their way into the container until eventually the mixture of ammonia in and out of the container is such that 
you know, it's equal. It's as though you never had ammonia in there. There's a slight increase in ammonia within the whole confines of the room, but as a whole, the inside and outside of the container have reached an equilibrium in the number of ammonia molecules per regular air, nitrogen, and oxygen molecule. Fusion, on the other hand, is the ability of a gas to pass through a tiny opening. Let's say you had helium and a balloon, and there was a little hole right there. It's a measure of the rate at which you know, individual or small groups of molecules can diffuse through that hole to intermix with uh, whatever gas is on the outside. And because uh, lower mass molecules like helium have to have a higher velocity in order to have the same temperature as higher mass molecules, you can see that uh, lower mass molecules like helium will tend to effuse more quickly because they have a higher velocity at the same kinetic energy, again because their mass is lower and the mass and velocity are inversely related. And though we've been covering uh, ideal gases this whole video, we're now going to be discussing real gases. And this is because most real gases at some point in temperature and pressure will deviate from ideal gas behavior. However, this is normally to do with the uh, constraints of elastic collisions and lack of attractive attractive forces between gases. Some gases, for example, water, which we'll remember is a polar molecule, will have, you know, slightly charged ends on it. And this means that when it passes by another water molecule, let's say, it will have an attractive force between these two molecules and therefore it won't obey the ideal gas constituent of no attractive forces. However, some uh, noble gases, let's say helium or neon, which are very unreactive and uh, not at all charged, will tend to obey ideal gas behavior over a wide variety of temperatures and pressures. However, most gases, when they get down towards their uh, boiling point, will tend to start to have intermolecular attraction, much like the water over here, and they will start to form, you know, water molecules, or not water molecules, but liquid molecules of whatever substance you're using, and they'll start to uh, collect together without any uh, space in between, and that will disrupt the ideal gas behavior.